Welcome to What the <coughs> is ORF, part one, the process in sequence. I'm Jen from Noteworthy by Jen, and I'm excited to be here with you today and hope that you can learn a lot from this. Just a little bit about me. I've taught for 16 years, and the whole time I've been attending ORF workshops. In fact, I attended them in college as well. I have three daughters, a husband, a dog, two cats, one of which I'm sure might make an appearance at some point, and I live in the great state of Michigan. I have taken ORF Levels 1 and 2, ORF Curriculum and Design, and Elemental Composing 1 and 2, which is basically almost, almost an extended version of ORF Level 3. I've also taken Kodai Level 1 and Music Learning Theory and Education Through Music courses, but ORF is my jam. My style is purposeful, practical, and playful. If that describes you too, then you're going to love ORF. This presentation is for people who don't know anything about ORF and want to learn. People who have attended some ORF workshops and are kind of curious but want to hear the bigger picture. People who love letting students be creative, who enjoy teaching through play, and want to create students who have a lifelong love of music. People who have trained in ORF but want a refresher of the main principles. Attention! The less fun part is first. <laughs> Disclaimer, I am not officially ORF certified because I haven't completed level three. I'm taking it later this summer. However, I have researched a lot prior to this presentation and I've also met with an ORF certified teacher to go through all of it to make sure that this presentation has integrity. So it is good information hopefully for you today. There is no way to fully grasp the whole ORF process through two 30-minute presentations. So this is going to give you a very general overview. If you want more information, you're really going to have to go to some workshops or take a levels course to fully grasp what's going on in ORF. Today is more about info than lessons. I'll give a couple little tiny lesson ideas, but this is more about people who just said, hey, what is ORF 101? So the first presentation is going to be like the process and the sequence, and then the next one, which will be tomorrow, is actually going to be about just the instruments, because I know when some people think about ORF, that's what they want to learn about. Have I mentioned ORF is my jam? It is. What do you think of when you hear the term ORF? Take a second to write down what you think. I'll give you some suggestions that you may have already thought. It's just about Carl Orff, the composer. Or maybe you think it's all about xylophones. Or maybe you think it's all about those xylophones with metal bars. Oh, maybe it's about those xylophones with metal bars, but they're smaller. Maybe it's a competitor to Kodai. Or all they do is pentatonic scales. So who was Karl Orff? He was a German composer. He lived from July 1st, 1895 to March 29th, 1982. His most famous composition was Carmina Burana. Oh, Fortuna. Yeah, that one. He always considered himself a composer first, and really music education was just his side gig. Gunild Kaepmann was someone who worked with ORF to create specific musical pieces and sequences meant for children. So she was actually the primary driving force behind ORF schulwork. And I don't have a picture of her that didn't have a copyright. So you can look up what she looked like if you would like online, but I wasn't able to put it in the presentation. But she's actually the brilliant mind behind a lot of ORF schulwork and the writing and the process. So the purpose of ORF Schulwerk is to awaken each child's musical capabilities. ORF and Kate Mon believed that children already were musical, we just had to kind of show them how they could find it within themselves. ORF Schulwerk is to create people who have a greater lifelong appreciation for the arts. So the idea is if you kind of open this door in children that the rest of their life when they see something in the arts they go, oh yeah, what they're doing is amazing, or Hmm, maybe that's not my style, but I really appreciate what they're doing. Orff also really felt it was important to bring back movement into our culture. He felt it was a cultural norm that had become lost and was imperative. And so that's where we get the folk dancing and movement to include um, when we're learning a song. 
or schulwerk is also about guiding students towards musical goals. So the process is always more important than the product in Orff Schulwerk. That is really important. It's not about just getting this cool sounding piece on xylophones. It's about the process and what students learn along the way. And they may never play that song perfectly. It may just be we get it okay and then we move on because they learned the objective of what we were trying to teach them. Also, Orff Schulwerk is about creating a general music education that children can build on quickly as they grow older. So it's giving students the tools they need to then be successful later on when they are in um, band or choir or whatever they decide to do. Orff had a very specific view of how the teacher should be used in the classroom. Really, it's Orff and Kate Mann. So the choice and appropriate use of even the simplest material is left to the educational instinct and intellectual range of the person teaching. So I want you to think about that. Orff was all about ha the teacher kind of having that control over what was appropriate for their own students, knowing what sequence would work well in their own setting, which is really unique to some uh, music philosophies. Some have a very certain sequence you have to follow, and others have a little more leniency like Orff does. The schulwerk teacher ideally is willing to recede more and more as the students gain in confidence and ability from a leadership role to a facilitator. So it's kind of a scaffolding thing. I do, we do, you do is the end goal of ORF where at the beginning we're giving them all the musical elements and by the end they should be the ones creating the music. There is a reciprocal relationship between teacher and students. The teacher facilitates what's happening. The students should regularly contribute to the lesson. This is more of a discovery learning model, allowing children to be active contributors in the learning process. So children should be contributing throughout the lesson. You should find ways to get them to contribute. Basically, Orff Schulwerk trusts the teacher to make the best choices for their individual teaching situation. Because obviously, if you're gonna see a group once every eight days, you're going to teach a different amount of music to them than if you saw them every other day. So every teacher needs to evaluate their own situation and then apply the ORF process to that situation. All right, enough with that stuff. Here's the types of media used. So we use speech, movement, singing, and instruments. For speech, we ORF decided to start with speech because our speech is naturally rhythmic. And so rhythm is the first concept taught in ORF. That could vary based on the culture you're in, but for, for America, that's what we start with. Children's rhymes and childhood sayings are an ideal source of material because they're already familiar to children and it's easier for them to remember, so we start with those. Short rhythm blocks of words and phrases are also studied and notated, so you might just take a couple words and figure out the rhythms that are in those, and eventually you're going to expand them into longer phrases and then use um, different meters, etc. Also, texts change. As the students get older, they don't need to rely on familiar speech as much. And so you could have more composed things or more complex things. You could use a familiar rhyme, but maybe put it in a mixed meter or in a regular meter. Speech should be used to develop pulse, rhythms, tempo, dynamics, and a whole bunch of other things. Speech should be based on what is known, even modern chants. So this is why sometimes you'll even see uh, in the same lesson, you might teach a folk song the whole way to using a song off off of a pop station. Because if it is something so familiar to most students, it is very useful in our classroom because they already have that in their musical vocabulary. And so we don't have to um, start back at the beginning. We could take something they already know and use it to teach them. So here's a speech example. Rain on the green grass, rain on the tree, rain on the rooftop, but not on me. And we might say, kids, what word do you see that's repeated in there? Rain, I see rain. Okay, great, we're gonna put snaps every time you see the word rain. Rain on the green grass, rain on the tree, rain on the rooftop, but not on me. Hmm, what does that rain fall on? The green grass, the tree, the rooftop. Again, you're getting student input, so they are actively involved in what's going on. Okay, every, every time we get to something that the rain falls on, we're gonna clap. So we still have rain snaps, and everything else is a clap. Rain on the green grass, rain on the tree, rain on the rooftop, but not on me. What other part do you feel like we should add something to? Oh, not on me, great. So we're gonna stamp for that one. So here we go. Rain on the green grass, rain on the tree, 
rain on the rooftop, but not on me. And they could really get into stamping at that last part. And then you might transfer those to unpitched percussion or something else later on. Movement. Orff believed that the civilized world no longer valued movement and it needed to be reintroduced as a cultural norm. And honestly, when, if you've ever done a folk dance in your class that your kids have just loved, there is an element of joy to that that I feel like we miss out on when they're only at home playing video games by themselves. And I know as music educators, you already know that, but there is something beautiful about kids working together. And that's why COVID has been so hard in some ways because we haven't been able to let them do those sorts of things. And they need each other. We need other people and to interact with them. So I can't wait and hope we get back to that a little bit. Orff believed movement and music are always linked. The kinesthetic understanding leads to creativity. So them being able to move and find different ways to move can even translate into how they think about music. Movement is used as a way to prepare musical concepts such as pulse, rhythms, phrases, and instrument playing. Movement is also used to show form. If you ever see spots where kids are just uh, creating a section, it's kind of their way of improvising and creating mm -hmm. um, something for movement so that they can learn more about form. Because when you actually go through and create sections of a song and do form for each section or uh, do a movement for each section of the form, then you're actually experiencing the form, not just talking about it and labeling it. All right, creativity is a huge value of Orff's work and should be encouraged as a form of improvisation in movement. The child is discovering who they are creatively, which will also help them improvise music later. So movement can just give them more comfortability with trying certain things, which will then transfer over to music. Movement is also a form are used as a form of personal expression and musical interpretation. And honestly, sometimes kids come up with some pretty creative things that are amazing to watch. All right, here's some movement examples. Responding to musical cues. So they might um, start dancing and stop when the music freezes. Okay, that's a really simple thing. Um, or maybe certain movements when a cue is heard. Okay, when it's forte, everybody raise their hand. When it's piano, everybody put your hands on your lap and different things like that mirroring the teacher. When you're mirroring with your students, you're basically giving them a movement vocabulary to pull from later. So mirroring is a great activity. Eventually you then switch to one student who feels confident leading the class and then they can work in pairs. But you always start with that part where the teacher does it first to give them some, some ideas and then they slowly work into doing it in pairs. Students also work in groups to create their own movements for a simple form. We already kind of talked about that. All right, singing. Orff considered singing to be the primary melodic media of Orff Schulwerk. Though it's already with us, it's something that we just have to learn the difference between talking and singing, and then we can use it as our primary melody. First singing patterns are taken from childhood chants. That's why we start with soul me. If you're in a different culture, you might start with something else. I am not familiar with other cultures enough to tell you those but you know your teaching situation and you want to base it on cultural songs of your region. Here's some examples. Echoing solfege patterns with Kerwin hand signals. Yup, we use them. And so we might echo, so me, so me, so me, do. And then the students would do it as well. Then you might uh, sing a song and show what the ending is and analyze it naughty kitty cat oh that's me me ray ray do and so we talk about those things we would have students singing their own solfege patterns again at first they're not going to be perfect but eventually they're going to learn more as their musical knowledge grows we're going to analyze solfege from a familiar song so we play a game talk about the ending to it analyze form and phrasing so we go through and talk about the song we were singing and and how we feel it as we're singing it instruments First comes body percussion, like we did with rain on the green grass. Natural sounds, snapping, clapping, padding, stamping. You can add other body percussion things, but those are the four that we primarily use in Orff work. Then you add the unpitched percussion, like drums, maracas, anything else like that. Then barred instruments. So this is what a lot of people associate with Orff Schulwerk. Xylophones, metallophones, and glockenspiels. If you want to know more specifically about those instruments and how we sequence them and use them, you're going to want to come to the next presentation tomorrow so that you can learn about those because I'm not going to go into great detail today. Recorders were also added as a melodic instrument because 
um, the teacher could play it. It was a reasonable price and they could move around while they were playing it so they could check on what the students were doing. That was one of the main reasons ORF chose the recorder. The learning process. So we've gone through all the media, the singing, the movement, the instruments, etc. Now we're going to look at the learning process. So we've got exploration, imitation, improvisation, and creation. And so really as you look down that list the creative um, or the critical thinking is being more and more developed as you go through the learning process. But they aren't always done in that order. It really depends on what you're teaching, what grade level, what their previous knowledge is. So it's up to you and your own discretion to see what order would be most effective. Younger students tend to do more of the exploration and imitation and may not get to as much of the improvisation and creation. And then the older, um, you know, upper elementary is going to do a lot more with improvisation and creation because you've already given them a musical vocabulary to pull from. All right, exploration. Definition. Discovery through experimentation of the sound and movement possibilities available within a given set of limitations. So you are giving them a guide, like you can do this or this and anything in between, but you want to give them a guide so it's not just craziness. You don't just say, okay, just try your instruments out. That's not going to go well. You might give them some other things, for example, a quick reaction exercise. So uh, glue dancing, they dance around, dance around, dance around. When you hold up a card that says like um, your bottom, then they have to glue their bottom to the ground and dance and dance and dance and dance with just their bottom glued to the ground. So they're experimenting with how they could dance like that. And then the next card might say one hand on the ground. Okay, so now they only have one hand on the ground and how can they dance with the rest of their body? Um, we always do group examples first or group dances first because it gets the child comfortable. They don't feel like they're being stared at and eventually then there might be more individual discovery. I have a friend that is a fly right now. I apologize for that. Must just really love Orf Schulwerk. work. Can't blame it. Show me the beat your own way. So you might be going through a song and you've given them a couple examples. Um, there's so many fun movements kids come up with to show the beat and it's just a little way for them to kind of explore things. Try finding the highest notes on your instrument. Okay, so they're still playing their instrument but it's with a purpose and they're trying to explore it. What can they notice? Hey, I noticed the longer notes are lower. Maybe you find out that, you know, Billy Joe over there doesn't really know the difference between high and low at all. So exploration can be great. Imitation, being able to repeat what is seen or heard. Examples, playing or singing a predetermined piece of music, learning it by rote. This is what a lot of people think of when they hear Orff Schulwerk, but it really doesn't encompass all that Orff is. So if we take a song from the volumes or a song you learned at your levels course and you play it and you teach it just by rote, that is imitation. And imitation is a really important part. Kate Mon really liked the idea of most of the music being learned by ear um, and learning to develop that ear, but we also teach it sometimes through showing notes on the board as well. Echo activities, mirroring movement is imitation, and repeating body percussion patterns. Okay, improvisation is when the student is the initiator of sound and movement within set parameters. So it starts with really short um, examples and expands as much as, as the kids learn more, then you start doing longer improvisation and more complex improvisation. At the beginning, it's more important that it happens than how it happens. Sometimes we spend a lot of time trying to expect perfection from our students. And um, really, at first, our job is just to get them comfortable with even trying. So it could be really, really simple. So here's an example that I'm going to show you later. It's called Tambourine Halloween. I'll tell you about that. That's a super, super simple, like one word improvisation. Um, then you, if you had kids playing the rhythm of the words on a children's rhyme in a pentatonic scale, rain on the green grass, rain on the trees, that would be um, really simple improvisation of, and that's why we use pentatonic because they can't really make it play a note that doesn't sound good. More complex question and answer because now you're asking them to think a little bit about, okay, I should take a little piece of the question and put it in my answer. You could also do improvisation or question and answer on the xylophones. And complex would be improvisation using full scale or modes. 
Okay, here's one I did with my students that they th thought was fun. It's really simple. So you've got some tambourines, like three kids have tambourines, you're sitting in a circle. This is my tambourine, I dressed it up for Halloween. This is my tambourine, I dressed it as a... And they have to come up with ideas of different costumes they could dress up their tambourine as. So maybe you're like, ooh, I could dress my tambourine up as, oh, I dressed it as a kitten and whatever. And then the goal is to go around the room and have everybody come up with a different idea. And the tambourines get passed around the circle. There's some directions here um, of how you can make it work. And then as uh, I'm actually going to have this in my TPT store for free so you can download it during this conference until July 3rd and download it for free. So if this is something that you're like, sweet, that would be a really simple activity for me to do, then grab it. An extension, because I've been trying to use a little bit of artwork in my music classroom as well, because some kids, music is really hard for them to show who they are sometimes. It just makes them a little uncomfortable, if depending upon their home life, but through art, sometimes they just shine. So I had them actually one day, I think I was gone or something, draw um, what their tambourine looked like. So here's some examples. So we've got a happy emoji. We've got a grandma who needs a little more support up top, if you ask me. We've got an atom, which was kind of creative. A cat. Oh, and the best one ever, because obviously a tambourine should be turned into Willie Nelson. <sighs> Such an amazing work of art right there. Creation. Students assembling their own pieces. So... The teacher is first responsible in Orf School work for providing the materials, and then it transitions slowly over to the student's responsibility. So the scaffolding slowly drops out, and the students start taking over and doing their own creation. Creation is making new material from the familiar. So now they have a musical vocabulary that you've been working on with them, and it's their time to take over and shine. So there's question and answer, especially if they're doing the question. All of a sudden, they're creating it out of nowhere. And it might be really simple. You get eight beats. You can use the la, notes B, A, G, and E. Create a question. Um, a, B, A. We might learn a piece where the A is already set, and then B, they have to come up with their own idea of what to do as a class. Small composing projects, it's really important you do those step by step. You cannot skip a step and assume that they're going to know what to do. You have to start really small. I'll show you some examples of really small in just a second. Rondo, A, B, A, C, A. So the A might be set, and then you might split kids up and have them decide um, how to create a B section, how to create a C section, and then put it all together. Theme and variation. This is a little more upper, upper level thinking, so this might be more fifth grade and beyond. Um, giving them a theme, and then they have to create a variation on that. Please note, and whenever talking about any of these things, improvisation, creation, it includes all media options. You can do this with speech. You can do it with movement. You can do it with singing. You can do it with instruments. Here's a really simple beginning composing example. So I all of a sudden realized Baby Shark is super easy to play on my recorder, and I went, well, then why am I not using it? All the kids know the song, even if they roll their eyes at it. Half of them will start going like this with it, you know? So um, in this, for Baby Shark, then they just put one beat worth of rhythm here. So I wrote on the board and said, you can use ta, ti, ti, tika, tika. And so then they went through in each box and wrote ta, ti, 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 ta. So then you have baby shark, ti, 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 baby shark, tika, tika, ta, baby shark, ti, ti, ta, baby shark. Really simple creation, but they finally just created something of their own with really small parameters so that it's kind of hard to mess up. Then, um, I've also let them create their own sharks. Oh my goodness, they're so funny. This is a fun activity to do. Um, I liked one of them that was really good was like taco shark. We had football shark. We had so many different sharks. And in this one, then I, I expanded it. So this one now, they have the ability to put a rhythm and then a note underneath. So instead of them playing the same note every time, now I might say you can use B, A, or G. And so now they're composing with rhythm and also with some, some different notes. So that's an, the next one. All right, resources for your classroom. I'm going to try to get as many of these done. If they're in black, they're not done yet, but they might be by the time you see this. So the tambourine Halloween, I will make sure I post that um, by the time this presents. And uh, Baby Shark will be half off. The instrument labels, I'm gonna have make labels that you can put on your instrument so if kids are looking at them, well, what am I playing? I don't know. It's there. 
Um, Orf rule posters look like this. I love having them up to show kids what they should be doing when we're playing and then they can't claim they didn't know because it's right there. My Orf book and presentation, you'll see more about that in the next one. There'll be instrument posters with what type of instruments and you can hang those up all around your room, Bordeaux, pentatonic posters. The Orf basics bundle will have all of these things in there if you want to get it at a discounted rate. Um, I do want to talk about treble clef note naming. So we do treble clef note naming. I start in fourth grade because that's when I teach a uh, recorder and so I want them to be able to see what it looks like on a staff. I've always felt like every method of teaching that I've tried has just gone a little too fast and those kids, there's always this group of kids that just don't understand. So I made a really step-by-step -step explanation this year and we did it in Google Slides and we have one-to-one -one technology so they all brought their Chromebooks in and they could go through it and I assigned it in Google Classroom so they all had their own copy and it was like an interactive thing and boy did it make a huge difference on what they understood and how they retained it over time and so it was really amazing. So if you're looking for a great treble clef resource just to walk, I mean it's like you just walk, it like does the lesson for you basically. It's great. Desktop percussion, if you're looking for a fun uh, activity on a random day, you don't even need desktop. I did it in my regular classroom and just had the kids bring two pencils and a book and we, we played along to a pop song and they had so much fun. Uh, recorder rules, this is what those look like, and glue dancing, which we talked about, the cue cards are right here. My whole store is up to is 20% off, and so I hope if you're looking for resources that you can find something in there that would be helpful to you. All the quotes were taken from the book, like we talked about, and here's where graphics and fonts were from that I used today. If you have any questions about Orf Schulwerk, or any of the information I shared today, you can email me at noteworthybyjen at gmail.com.